hey friends, we have another great episode today. And today we are going to dive into finances, but not money mindset necessarily, but how can you fund this business, this big audacious dream that you have without breaking the bank and without having to have someone else's approval and with the security of knowing that you can fund your business, you can invest in yourself, invest in your business for your future success and to make all those dreams come true. So we're going to talk about money. My guest today's motto is building businesses that are conducive to happiness but you have to start somewhere, right? And a lot of times, if you don't have the cash sitting around, you have a discovery call, you meet with a coach and you think to yourself, oh, I would really love to do this, but I can't afford it. We're gonna talk about those resources that are available to you today and why investing in yourself is so important for that initial phase of growth. We're also gonna talk about how we don't need to rush to grow and scale our business because that growth can come at a pace that is right for us. And there is no pace that is standard, universal for every entrepreneur out there. So we're also going to dive into that a little bit too, to take some of the pressure off of you as an entrepreneur, starting your business, growing your business, so that you can feel confident and secure in every endeavor as you move forward. Diane Tarshis, welcome to the Robin Graham Show. Robin, thank you so much for having me. I am happy that you're here and I am really excited to dive into this topic. One of the major objections, I guess the most frequent objections I get from coaching clients is, oh, I can't afford it right now. I have to sell more product. I need to get more clients or let me talk to my spouse. And these objections sometimes are associated with money mindset, but a lot of times it's a lack of resources. And when I'm having my discovery calls, coach around opportunities and ways to get money. And some of my clients have been very resourceful how they've gotten the money to invest in coaching. And to me, that shows great trust in themselves. It shows great trust in the process, but it also shows that they're ready and willing to do what it takes to build that business that they have had a calling for placed on their heart. So I can't wait to to dive into this and give other women the resources that they need so they can follow their dreams and create something that they love and have a bigger impact in the world. Okay. With all of that said, I would love for you to tell the listeners a little bit about you, a little bit about yourself, your journey, where you live, all of that good stuff. Okay. As you've heard, I'm Diane Tarshis, and I am the founder of Startup Distillery, which is a consulting firm I founded 22 years ago, where I help entrepreneurs distill their dreams into growing businesses through custom business plans or roadmaps and one-on-one business building consulting. So I focus primarily on early stage businesses as early as just an idea, and I am industry agnostic and geographically agnostic. So that means I work with entrepreneurs in a wide variety of industries from all over the world, ranging from beverages to biofuels, interior design to product design, movie production to medical devices and distilleries, of course. And and prior to founding my firm, I had a broad corporate background that included a stint on Wall Street in investment banking, manufacturing, operations, and retail, all of which informs the work that I do. On the personal side, I live in Chicago, about five blocks west of Wrigley Field with my husband and our dog, Super Cooper. I have two grown sons who are in their 20s. The youngest just graduated from college, so I am officially an empty nester. And yep, I think that's me. (laughs) Okay, so this is so funny that I didn't know you lived that close to Wrigley Field. So I grew up in the St. Louis area, so I'm a big... Cardinals fan. Oh, but, yeah. and, and my husband, his whole family's from Chicago. So he is a Cubs fan. So this is a big rivalry for us. But we have so many incredible memories of going to Wrigley Field to watch the Cubs card series every year. Yeah. So much fun. It's fun. Wrigleyville, like there's just <laughs> no place like it on earth. It's really a lot of fun. And as you heard offline, I'm a native New Yorker, but I've been living here in Chicago long enough to 
understand the Midwest rivalry and it's a really big deal here. So <laughs> it is a very big deal. Yes. A bit all good in Philadelphia the the sports fans can get very yeah. intense and yeah. sometimes not so nice at all, but you don't have that in the Midwest. It's a healthy rivalry and it's really yeah. fun. Like after the games, everybody goes to the bars and everybody's talking and having fun and it's all good. Okay. So we digress there, but I just had to say that because <laughs> it makes me happy. Let's dive into this, Diane. So as we were talking talking before we hit record, you work with both men and women. Mm -hmm. And there is a significant difference between men and women in terms of their willingness to take extraordinary measures to get the money they need to invest in their business, to start that business, to build the dream that they have or the calling they have. So let's talk a little bit about that. I'd love your, your feedback, your insight, and then Let's dive into, after that, the resources that women can tap into without right. breaking the bank or hurting their own personal finances. Right. There is this difference. And I, I just want to say, no one needs to take extraordinary measures. There are things that can feel relatively comfortable or just uh, a little bit outside your comfort zone. It's nothing that has to be dramatic. But having worked with, frankly, mostly men in my business, but a nice chunk of women too, I definitely see a gender difference. And it's funny because, listen, I'm a woman too. And so I relate so much to the thinking that we all have. There's definitely a difference. What I find is that men in general are bigger risk takers. They're willing to have a half-baked idea and to dive in. And women, and this includes me for sure, we like to have everything prepared up front. We like to be completely set and know for sure that this is going to work. And in reality, when you're starting a business, there's always going to be some level of risk. And the question is, how much risk are you willing to take? And on the financial side, a lot of that discomfort comes from not having the information that you need. And the information that you need is what is exactly the offering that I'm going to be selling? What is the product or products? What are the services? How am I going to deliver them? What do they look like? What do they feel like? Who are the suppliers? All of this detail conceptually, who is my target audience? Who do I want to sell this to? But then the numbers that support the concept. So whatever it is that you're selling you need to develop the financial projections. And it doesn't matter if it's something that is completely service-based, even consulting businesses that don't have a lot that you need to invest up front, or whether it's something more complex, but you need that information. And unless you put together the financial projections to support your concept, then you're operating with only half the information. And then it seems even more scary because you don't know how much it's going to cost to launch your business, how long it should take to become profitable, what those early months are going to look like in terms of money going out versus money coming in and developing benchmarks in terms of what would be reasonable in terms of what you should expect for revenues and sales coming in. So it's really, to me, it's a matter of information in order to build comfort. 100%. And I think there's so many little nuances when we start a business that we don't necessarily think of just from a systems perspective. If you're going to be a virtual coach, you need Zoom or some platform that you're going to have to pay for. You need an email marketing system and the free levels can be great for starting out, but you're going to very quickly grow out of those. So then what is the one that's going to work for you? What is the one that is going to give you the most longevity without having to change platforms, which can be a huge source of anxiety and stress. You're, you're reminding me of something, which is, I don't mean to sound salesy, but I have to say, when you're starting a business, one of the most important things is to take advantage of the knowledge that people have, those who have gone before, right? So I don't mean to sound mercenary here, but taking advantage of consultants and coaches who can guide you and let you know what's what to expect down the road. What you just talked about, as simple as the platform you want to use for video conferencing, but there were so many of those little things that add up that if you work with someone who's experienced, then they're going to let you know ahead of time, 
hey, you forgot to think about X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. And then you can be prepared, make sure to have fully fleshed out operational plans and financial plans. Exactly. And you have to know those things going forward. And a lot of times we don't, and I say this all the time to my clients who say, oh my gosh, I had no idea. We don't know what we don't know. And there are things that I had to learn and I did everything like hard knocks, right? That was, Mm -hmm. I tried to do everything myself, but let me tell you, it cost me years in my business. So I should have borrowed that money from our personal savings account, which I ended up doing anyway, and having the professional website done, having the tools and systems put into place up front by hiring someone to guide me. Instead, I tried to do it all by myself. And what that did was cost me time and money because I had to backtrack or change things midway through. And so many people don't realize that if you have someone to guide you and hold your hand and help you create those processes that then if you do need to hire a team member later on, or if you're going to be absent from your business for a while, you have something in place that you can turn things over to them to say, okay, here's how we do this. Take it over for me. And, and then think about too, I love the fact that you talk about this and really mapping out that financial plan, what it's going to take, because if you don't plan for growth, And I'm not saying you have to grow fast, but if you do grow fast, you have to plan for what is it going to take to have help? And especially if you have a product business or a business where you are taking on the roles and responsibilities of fulfillment, that's going to take a lot of time. And if all of a sudden you are this new coach, you enter the market and, or you're a service provider and you enter the market and everybody flocks to you, you're going to need help. And so factoring all those things in from the tech, from the website, from any type of assistance you might need. But I think most importantly is having that person. It does sound salesy and I'm not selling at all. I just think that you and I both know because of where our clients are in their journey, because we do very similar work, is that you have to have help. We're not meant to do it alone. And those resources ultimately that you invest in help will help you in the long run. And the ROI is visible. There's a saying, it came from a movie that I saw. It was a documentary called Big Little Farm. And it's really stuck with me, this quote of, you can, there's never enough time to do it right, but there's always enough time to do it over. So think about that. We all feel like, oh my God, there's never enough time, or I don't have the money. But in the end, we're going to have to, if we don't do it right, the first time we're going to have to do it over and we're going to have to spend that money. So it, it's really, I'm going to date myself because this is an old commercial, but there used to be this old Fram oil filter commercial where he said, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. And that's the way I think about it. I think all of this is really a matter of the issue is coming up with a plan. It doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be like a a full business plan. If you have a complex business, then yes, that's called for. But if it's not complex, if it's consulting or um, coaching or something, I want to say a little more manageable, you can do something as simple as what I call them roadmaps, but a lot of people call them business model canvases. I took the traditional business model canvas and I simplified it even more, frankly, and made it more user-friendly. And that's what I use with clients. And so that addresses both the conceptual stuff. What am I offering? Who am I selling it to? How am I going to sell it? That kind of stuff. And then also the financial piece. And if you have some sort of a framework, then you have an operating blueprint and that includes growth. And whether the growth is fast or slow, either way, you still want to plan for it because you want to know what you're shooting for. You want to know what you're aiming for. Recommend that you look at your plan every year to see if you're in the place that you want to be. Are you doing what you want to be doing? Or did inertia kind of push you off track and you didn't notice? So reflecting back and saying, you know what? I need to make a course correction or Mm -hmm. I'm doing this thing that I don't really enjoy and rejiggering things. But either way, you want to have a plan. And then that plan will serve you if you need money 
from outside sources. And outside could even be your partner, your spouse or your business partner, whatever. But if you need to, let's say, pitch your spouse and talk about what I'd like to use some of our savings for this business idea. If you have a plan in writing, whether it's a business model canvas type thing or a full on business plan or something in between, then you're going to come off as far more prepared, far more professional, and you're going to be taken seriously. And if you want to go to friends or family and raise funds that way, the impression that you're going to make is far different and you will get a much more positive response from people. So it all comes back to this sort of initial roadmap of what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. So. Yeah. And I interviewed Maureen Borzicello on the show. Gosh, it's been over a year ago, I'm sure. But she talked about the percent of women who actually take advantage of business loans. And in that episode, mm-hmm. we talked also about how it wasn't until I think the 90s that women were able to actually sign for a business loan themselves before that really that late. I think it was the nineties. Oh my God. I hope that's not true because that is really depressing. (laughs) No, I'm pretty sure it was the nineties at the very earliest. It was the eighties, but I'm pretty sure it was in the nineties that men had to co-sign loans for business loans for women. Oh my so God. we know we no longer, my point in saying that is that we yeah. no longer have that as an excuse. We can do this ourselves. And if you have the documentation showing what your business model is, what you expect to earn and all of the processes that you're going to take to grow this business initially, or what the interest is in the business, et cetera, the bank is going to work with you. And right. now that the, the rates are relatively low in terms of interest, <laughs> I yeah. think of the word interest, but as you were talking, it made me think there are so many things, like I said before, we don't know what we don't know. And there are systems and tools that you can use for free. There are things that you can do from a marketing perspective, PR perspective, things mm-hmm. that you can do to grow your business that aren't going to cost you an arm and a leg. So when you invest right. up front in someone to help you, ultimately you're going to save money and you're going to have a, an ROI on what you've invested in that help. Exactly. And there are other non-traditional resources. So there's a, a woman that I work with, she's a securities attorney, and she specializes in non-traditional fundraising for entrepreneurs. And when I say non-traditional, that doesn't mean sketchy or anything. It means that she has, so there are loans, there are investors, those are the traditional avenues. She does crowdfunding, but it's more identifying your target and helps advise entrepreneurs on how to raise money for their ventures through through this this crowdfunding that is very targeted and she's had incredible success and I love working with her because everything she does makes listen I've been doing this for over 20 years and this makes so much sense of pitching your business to the people who would naturally be interested in Mm -hmm. what it is you're offering. And so there are these alternative opportunities. There's more than one way to skin a cat. And again, this is why you work with professionals so that you can access these ideas, these resources, and then go into it prepared so that you'll um, be successful. Yeah, absolutely. And I actually have a good friend. She was on the show a couple of times. She's a former PR agent, but she now has pretty pep talks, KJ Blattenbauer. And I can't think of the episode number, but listeners, I'll put that in the show notes. So you can go back and listen to the episode where we talked about her new business and how she's transitioned, but she actually did a Kickstarter campaign to raise the funds for her business. So she targeted those people she knew would be interested in luxury stationery and would appreciate her new endeavor. And Mm -hmm. she raised an incredible amount of money to support the kickoff of her business. She was able to get her printing press. She was able to get the stock, the inks, everything she needed to create this new business. And if you have something that if you have that calling on your heart and you feel that you have a purpose, you're going to make an impact. If you pursue this, invest in yourself, don't sit in this place 
of fear and, and agony that I want to do this, but I just can't afford it because there are resources. So like Diane said, there's resources where you could borrow from family members. You could borrow from retirement funds. You could borrow from a bank get a business loan, you could do a Kickstarter campaign or any of these other um, crowdfunding platforms that you could use. Um, you can sell things. If you have things sitting around in your house that you don't right. need, you don't use right. vintage clothing or antiques, anything, sell them to invest in your business. And so there are resources. And I think it's important to recognize that you don't have to take on this burden and necessarily bootstrap your way and then fail your way forward. You could actually do it in a way that you're hitting the ground running with your business right. because you've right. built the foundation first and you've set yourself up for success. Right. And you can listen, I've got plenty of clients who've started out bootstrapping and that's fine to a point. And then you, what's nice is you can confirm that you're on the right track. Right. And also you have proof that people are willing to pay for whatever it is you're offering. Yes. So that puts you in a better negotiating position when it comes to investors, proof if you're going for a loan. I'll be honest, I don't recommend taking money out of your retirement fund to fund your business. I'd rather see people do it another way. Um, right. I guess I shouldn't have said retirement fund. I was thinking like <laughs> savings accounts, not, not, yes, not save, like a 401k, save, sounds, not the IRA. That not makes that. me feel better. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't mean that because there are significant tax consequences with that. I right, meant right. like savings account. Yeah. So <laughs> let's you and I are on the same that. page. Yes. But... <laughs> let's clarify that. <laughs> yeah. But I will tell you what's nice and Kickstarter, Indiegogo, all, all of these platforms are, are great. And then the woman that I was talking about, her name is Jenny Casson, and she does something even more targeted that is so smaller in scope. And I, I just love what she does, but that's a whole nother conversation. So anyway, there are opportunities out there, but you have to start out with, I keep hammering this home with the plan that is both conceptual and financial, because without that, where are you going? How are you going to do it? Everyone's going to be asking and you need to be able to answer those questions. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you spell Jenny's name? I'd like to put her link in the show notes in case anyone is interested in learning more from her about financing. She is at jennycasson.com. So it's J-E-N-Y-K-A-S-A-N.com. Okay, awesome. I'll put that in the, the show notes. And if you contact her, tell anyone. her I sent you. Of course. <laughs> so. Of she's, course. She's wonderful. And actually you can, I think you can go on Amazon and also on her website. She has a wonderful book, the uh, paperback that explains her process and what's involved. And when I first met her, I was so excited. Uh, I bought a copy. We ended up, I ran one of her client comp fabs because she was on vacation. The work that she does is really amazing. Really cool. Yeah. I have to look because I was just pitched, someone pitched to be a guest on the show who does fundraising and she was from the nonprofit world first. And now she's switched over to work with entrepreneurs. And I, I don't think it was this name, but oh, no, Jenny is a securities attorney and, and she okay. doesn't, she's in a different world. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it's not the same person. Mm -mm -mm. No. Yeah. It's fascinating listeners. I hope that you have found this information super helpful. I know for me, it's something that's near and dear to my heart because I have watched so many people try to start their business by themselves. And then I look at their business and I think, oh my gosh, if only I could have helped them beforehand. So and I know Diane, that you have that same, that same viewpoint. And it's really it, sad to see it people. Hurts my heart, you know, yes, <laughs> it does. It breaks my heart because I think of where people could be if only they had right. taken the time to map out the plan and then take the opportunity to get funds and then invest those funds into their business upfront. I just think that it's so, it makes life so much easier. It takes away the stress and the overwhelm and the frustration to the point where you just want to give up because you're so burnt out and nothing's working. Yeah. So with all of that said, listeners, thank you for staying until the end of the episode. And I really do appreciate you. If you found this information helpful, if you could please leave us a rating and review, because that will help more people find this episode and learn more about the work that Diane's doing, the work that I do. But more importantly, if you know someone who's wanting to start a business, send this their way, because maybe we'll help them start off on the right foot versus having to backtrack over time. Diane, where can the listeners learn more about you, connect with you? Listeners can 
find me at startupdistillery.com. All my contact info is on there, my online calendar, my phone number. I love spontaneous phone calls. So don't stand on ceremony. You could always just pick up the phone and call. You could sign up for my newsletter there and get details about my service. Oh, speaking of which, I don't want to forget, I wanted to offer your listeners a special opportunity for three months. I am offering a coupon code for one hour of free consulting by using the code Robin, spelled the correct way with a Y. (laughs) And again, I'll make that available for three months for your listeners. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's so generous of you. And listeners, you can always reach out to me too. I love, oh my gosh, I love spontaneous phone calls, but I also love, I love emails popping in as well. So anyway, without any further conversation here, we are going to close out the episode. I thank you so much, Diane, for being here and sharing this wealth of knowledge and helping other people. Thank you so much for having me. This was a really good topic. I'm glad we talked about it. Oh, thank you.